In the country of Iran, there's a pastor there named Youssef Nadarkhani. Since 2009, he's been sitting in jail, guilty of loving Jesus. That's what he's guilty of. He wrote in to the school system there and said, you know, his kids were being forced to learn uh, from the Quran, and he's, he revoked his Muslim faith and embraced Jesus. And so they ended up taking him to jail. He's a church planter. He's planted a number of churches in an evangelical denomination there in Iran. And they have now uh, sentenced him to execution for following Jesus. And there were some reports that were spinning around this past week that he had already been executed. That is not true. Um, but the execution has been ordered. That's how he was found. And so we're praying and trusting that God will spare him for his own glory, for God's own glory. And I'd encourage you to pray for him as well. They, they took away his freedom. Um, as a result, he's got two you know, young kids as well. And um, they took away his freedom. He's been jailed for a few years. Um, now sentenced to die. This would be exhibit A for what persecution looks like. This is exhibit A. Now, we're going to talk some about that theme today because our text in Galatians chapter 4 um, has that for us to see. Um, but we're going to get to it maybe in a little bit of a roundabout way. I'm, what persecution does ultimately is it tries to steal our freedom. Um, that's what we see from his life, and that's what we'll see in differing degrees in our own life. And Paul was dealing with this idea of persecution in Galatia. And it's important for us to pay attention to this because of what Paul was dealing with in Galatia. He was dealing with people who were coming from Jerusalem who were saying, hey, you that are just a embrace the gospel, embrace Jesus plus nothing crowd, we're saying you've got to embrace the law plus your faith in Jesus. And so they were imposing and forcing them to do some of these types of things, to obey dietary rules and table fellowship laws and uh, specific days that they had to you know, uh, honor and the laws associated with those days and circumcision as adults who were not even Jewish. They were forcing them to do these types of things. So Paul ends up combating them in this regard because he's basically saying to them, hey, don't think for one second that this is going to lead you to freedom. Freedom did not come for you in obedience to the law. Freedom came for you when you believe the gospel, when by faith you put your trust in Jesus. That's where freedom came for you. So don't get bound up by all of these other things. They were just shadows that were pointing to the reality. The reality is Jesus. And when you put your faith in him, that's when everything changes. That's when everything transforms. That's when the spirit of God comes to live inside of you. That is where you experience freedom. And so they were, they were jeopardizing the freedom of the Galatian Christians. And so Paul is going to kind of give us a little bit of a dense theological argument, so to speak, in Galatians chapter 4. And if it helps you, uh, if you want to jot this down, and you'll see it in just a second, but if it helps you, the way that you can understand kind of the, what we call the exegesis, that's not like Jesus Christ, that's E-X-E-G-E-S-I-S, exegesis, kind of the understanding how we, how we open up the text. Um, the way to understand that, here's what Paul does. Paul first asks a question, then he gives an illustration, then he interprets that illustration, and then he makes an application, okay? So that's how you can walk through this passage and maybe understand it a little bit better. He asks a question, he gives an illustration, he gives the interpretation of that, and then he gives an application for the Galatian situation. I just said a lot of IONs, right? A lot of shuns. <laughs> okay, so look with me in verse number uh, 21, and it'll give us the question that he asked them. He says, tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says. In other words, he pauses and he says, okay, those of you who are bringing this whole idea of it's got to be faith in Jesus plus the law, those of you who are bringing that in, you want to talk about the law? Let me ask you a question, Paul says. Do you even know what the law says? Because I'm going to break it down for you in just a second. This is what Paul's doing. You don't even really know what the law teaches. So what he does is he says, okay, let me give you an illustration from the law. And this is the second piece there. So he asks a question, then he gives an illustration in verse number 22. It says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way, 
but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a promise. Now, it's interesting what Paul's going to do here because in the beginning part of uh, chapter 4, as we heard uh, Pastor Dion really, really beautifully and masterfully unpack that for us last week, just a fantastic job teaching that text. Um, I, we're, we're blessed to have a lot of great teachers and stuff around here, you know? We really are. We really, really are. I mean, I'm, I got to watch the message. I wasn't here, but I got to watch the message. Just a really, really good job with that text, helping us understand what it means to be sons and daughters of God. And so in the beginning part of chapter 4, uh, we, we hear Paul teaching us about what it means, our sonship, our daughtership, so to speak. And now what he does when he's saying, oh, you want to talk about the law? Let me tell you what the law says. Now he goes to an illustration about sons. And he's saying there were two that Abraham had, one with the slave woman and one with the free woman. Now, if I could back you up for a second and maybe jog your memory, I think this might help you. Genesis chapter 12 is where we run into Abraham, all right? We run headlong into Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And here's what happens. God makes a promise, a covenant, so to speak, with Abraham. And he says, Abraham, through you, I am going to create a people known as Israel, ultimately. I'm going to create a people, and this people is going to be a blessing to the nations. They're going to demonstrate my glory in the world. This is what I'm creating them to do so that they can testify to my glory in the world. Now, you got to remember, Abraham was not young. Abraham was old, and his wife couldn't have children. And so when God makes this promise to Abraham, it was a big deal because God was saying, you're going to have, I'm making a promise to you, Abraham. This isn't by anything you've done. I'm making a promise to you. You're going to have descendants like the sands of the seashore. And he's probably thinking to himself, wow, because I don't have any right now. I don't have any kids. I don't have anybody. I've got Sarah, and she can't have children. So it's like, whew, how's this going to happen? So God makes this promise, right? Now, when we get to Genesis chapter number 16, we find something happening that we need to pay attention to. In Genesis 16, Sarah is starting to get frustrated. That's Abraham's wife, right, Sarah? She's getting frustrated because this promise is not happened. And she's thinking to herself, man, uh, God has promised that we're going to have kids, we're going to have a child, and through this child is going to come this people, and this people is going to be for the blessing of the nations, but it's not happening. And so she finally just says, you know what? Here's what we need to do, Abraham. My maidservant, who's Egyptian, named Hagar, I want you to take her, and she'll have a child that will be the child kind of of ours, so to speak, certainly of yours, a child of promise that we'll raise. Abraham's like, well, I don't, you know, I don't know. And, and she says, yeah, let's, we need to do this. This is what we should do. So Abraham, you know, he gets involved with Hagar. Hagar gets pregnant. Now what happens when Hagar gets pregnant with Abraham's kid? You got to remember this. She's pregnant with Abraham's son. Sarah is married to Abraham. She can't have any kids. Hagar's thinking, I'm pregnant with his son. She starts despising Sarah. Sarah is not real thrilled with Hagar either. Could you imagine this dynamic, by the way? I mean, are you picturing this? Don't, it's not a good dynamic, right? Now, Hagar starts despising Sarah because she has, she has carrying the child of Abraham. Sarah starts mistreating Hagar. You can imagine, right? She's Abraham's wife. She's like, I, you know, maybe she's thinking, what was I thinking when I said to do this? And now she's pregnant. So she treats her so bad that Hagar checks out. She's like, I'm out. I am out. She leaves. She's gone. While she's gone, an angel of God appears to Hagar and says, hey, you need to go back. Don't check out. You need to go back. And by the way, here's what you need to name your son. Ishmael. That means the Lord hears. So you name your son Ishmael, but you go back. She goes back. Well, she goes back. She has the child, right? Ishmael. 14 years pass. And then guess what? Sarah is pregnant. What? Right? She was already really old. Now she's really, really old. And she's She's now pregnant. God promised this was going to happen, and it certainly did because God is not a man that he should lie. He keeps his promises all the time, and he promised this was going to happen. They thought they were getting frustrated, so Sarah said, let's circumvent what, you know, let's, let's take the promise into our own hands. God's like, I don't need your help. 
And so she gets pregnant. She's now carrying a child. She has the child. The child's name is Isaac, which means laughter, and you can imagine, right? Everybody she tells, yeah, I just had a kid. <laughs> I would be laughing too, right? Isaac. So Isaac is born, and then Isaac is nursing, and you've got Ishmael and Hagar in the same house with Sarah and Isaac. This is an interesting dynamic. And Abraham, who's just like, I guarantee Abraham was bald. <laughs> Wouldn't have had a choice. His hair would have just had to turn loose, right? I mean, how do you navigate this whole situation? It's a, it's a, it's a testy one, right? So... When Ishmael, I mean, when, when Isaac finally gets to a place where he is weaned, he's not nursing anymore, he gets a little bit older, they throw a feast for him. Now listen to what Genesis chapter 21 says about this. It says these words. The child, Isaac, grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son. For that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son, Isaac. Now, you can imagine, right? He, Isaac grows. He's now weaned. He's not being nursed anymore. Abraham throws a big feast, which was common in the ancient days. Ishmael, who's 14 years older, right, now starts mocking him at his little party. Sarah says, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> this is the child of promise. You do not start mocking him. And so she said to Abraham, you send them away. Abraham, if you read the story, he's like, he's going, I mean, it's, it's my son too, you know? I mean, Ishmael's my son too. I can't just send him away. So he turns to God, God, you know, I mean, what am I to do? And, and God says, do what she said. Send them away, but know this, I'm gonna take care of them. I'm, I'm, they went under a tree. They felt like they were deserted. They were crying out to God. But God heard, and God still met them right where they were, Hagar and Ishmael, and made a nation out of Ishmael, as God said he was going to do. So you've got this illustration, right? There was a question. Oh, you, you think you know the law? You want to appeal to the law? And then he gives, an, he gives this illustration. He says, let me tell you about a couple of sons, one born to the slave woman, one born to the free woman. Then he interprets this illustration, all right? There's an interpretation. Look in verse number 24. Paul says, these things, in other words, talking about, the, uh, about Hagar and Sarah and Ishmael and Isaac, these things may be taken figuratively for the women represent two covenants. One covenant, covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother, for it is written, be glad, O barren woman who bears no children. Break, break forth and cry aloud, you who have no labor pains, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you're going, if that's the interpretation, that cleared nothing up for me, <laughs> right? I'm reading this, and he's just flying all over the place, Mount Sinai and Arabia and the law, and, you know, and you're just starting going, whoo, Jerusalem, what's happening here? I don't know what's going on. Well, let me break down for you what he's trying to say here, all right? If I, if I could put it into two columns, here's how it would look. And it's right there for you. Those of you who, who are writing all this down, you may not be able to get all this and don't panic, all right? Because some of you are the panicky write down things people. And if you don't get it, you're like, you missed the rest of the message. You're too busy looking at people's, you know, what, what was that? How do you spell Hagar? What was that? You know, and, so, and then you just miss what I'm talking about, all right? So look, on one side, you've got Hagar. On the other side, you've got Sarah. Hagar had Ishmael, the natural way. Sarah had Isaac, who was a child of the promise. Mount Sinai, according to this, Paul compares Hagar to Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was the place where what was given? The law, right? The law was given to Moses at Mount Sinai. Sarah is compared to, kind of intrinsically, to Mount Zion, the Mount of God. Hagar's compared to the law. Why? Because she's also compared to Mount Sinai. Sarah's compared to the spirit. Hagar's compared to the earthly Jerusalem where they're embracing the law. They're saying faith in Jesus plus obeying all the law, which was coming out of not where all the Jerusalem church was, but some out of Jerusalem were saying that. Sarah's compared to the Jerusalem above, 
In fact, when, uh, when uh, Isaiah 54 is quoted here, where it talks about, be glad, O barren woman who bears no children, it's, that actual context is talking about the Jerusalem that's to come. And what Paul does is he compares the Jerusalem to come with Sarah in his little illustration here. And then with Hagar, compared with slavery, Sarah compared with freedom. Now, why is this interpretation so startling? Listen close. Because those who are coming from Jerusalem are coming to Galatia and they're saying, those of you who heard that the gospel was just about faith in Jesus alone, you don't have it all. I need to fill you in. You also need to obey the dietary laws. You also need to obey the Sabbath. You also need to be circumcised. You gotta fulfill all the law plus Jesus. Now here's what Paul says. Paul says they're coming in saying the reason that you need to do all of these things is because we from Jerusalem, from Israel, are the children of Abraham from Sarah's line. We are the descendants of Abraham from Sarah's line because it was the non-Jews that were descendants of Abraham through Hagar's line, right? So he's saying, well, here's what I want you to understand. We are the people of the promise because we are ethnically Jewish. And therefore, if you want to be children of Abraham, if you want to be children of the promise, if you want to be sons and daughters of God, you need to be like we are, which means keeping all of the law and go ahead and have faith in Jesus at the same time. Paul's going, oh no, that is not what this means. He says... I'm telling you about Hagar and Sarah, and I'm telling you about Ishmael and Isaac, and I want you to take these figuratively for a moment. Pause. Paul doesn't mean that these weren't real people that really existed in history that were, you know, he's not meaning that. He's just saying, let me use this as an illustration. It's a typology. And so he says, those that want to keep the law and not just embrace faith in Christ, they are connected to Hagar. They are people of the law, connected to the earthly Jerusalem, connected to Mount Sinai, connected to the law, connected to slavery. He said, those who have faith in Jesus, they are from the line of Abraham and Sarah because they are now people of the promise because the promise was about faith. It wasn't about the works of the law. So he's saying, I want you to get, this was a radical statement for the people that were listening to this because they were probably going, he just flipped this whole thing upside down. He took it off of the ethnic identity track and said something completely different. Then he makes an application. Verse number 28. He says, now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. He's talking to the Galatian believers, right? You brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. Who was the one born in the ordinary way? Ishmael. Who was the one born by the power of the Spirit? Isaac, right? And he says, at that time, the son born in the ordinary way, Ishmael, persecuted, did you catch it? Persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. Listen to this statement. It is the same now. He's making a direct application to Galatia. But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. We read that from Genesis 21. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. So the application he makes in the Galatian context with these people who are coming into their midst, trying to make them obey all of the law instead of understanding that this is only about faith in Jesus Christ alone, plus nothing, minus nothing. He says, you know what this is like? This is just like when Ishmael, who was the child of, of kind of uh, not of promise, was persecuting Isaac, who was the child of promise, who mocked him and persecuted him. It's just like that now. This is exactly what's going on here in Galatia. And I would say to you, it is the same now as it was then. You see, when we start looking at 2012 in our world, we can look back and go, it's the same as it was in Paul's time, and it's the same as it was prior to that. Because in our world, we all experience some degree of persecution. Now, I gave you an illustration earlier with Pastor Youssef Nadarkhani, who is in Iran, and I, this is exhibit A of what the kind of, um, the highest degree of persecution could be, where your life is on the line, where you could be executed for being a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, in the United States, we don't so much uh, have that going on, right? We still do live in a country that is civilized, that is, not, that is you know, free, 
we do have some of that freedom being impinged from time to time and infringed upon. I get it. Uh, but generally speaking, we are free. You can still uh, be somebody who's involved in your local church that loves Jesus and the community at large doesn't think that you're a moron. They kind of go, okay, you know, yeah, you're free to do that. You could still send your kid if you wanted to to a, a, a Christian school and nobody's going to say you ought to be locked up in jail, right? So we still have some of that freedom. But there are degrees of persecution that happen in our midst. Now, I want to tell you what persecution isn't. And then I want to explain to you what my definition of persecution is, and then I want to make some application for our present circumstance. See, what persecution isn't, it's not um, you having trouble raising your teenager. That's not persecution. It may, you may say, oh, you haven't been in my house, you know. It's not that, okay? It's not that. It's not when the server crashes at work and you can't get any of your email. That's not persecution, okay? It's not when we have a tough job uh, climate in the United States and it's a little difficult to get work. That's not persecution. All of those things are real issues. All of those things are things that may be tough to navigate, but let's not call any of those persecution. I think we do a great disservice to people around the world who are facing legitimate persecution when we start calling this stuff persecution. Are they issues? Yes. Are they things we have to deal with? Yes. Are they inconvenient or maybe even troublesome or maybe even bring some heartache? Sure, all of those things. But they're not persecution. See, in the United States, I'm not sure that we fully understand what persecution is, but let me, let me give you a definition that I want to use based upon our text as to what persecution is. Here it is. Persecution are attempts to steal our freedom through opposing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what persecution is. Attempts to steal our freedom through opposing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, here's how we make application here. And here's some things that, I, this is where I want you to hear it. Because you got, you got a little bit longer sleep. Some of you that normally come to nine o'clock, you came to 11 today because you skipped out. You got a little longer sleep. I get it. You lost an hour and you wanted to make it up. I'm with you. <laughs> but they were pretty awake at nine o'clock. It took them a little bit, but they, they started coming with me. And I think that you're ready and you're gonna come with me because you're ready to hear something that God wants to say to you. Now, I'm, I'm acting in good faith there. Some of you are going, I'm not ready for nothing, you know? <laughs> well, I'm gonna trust that the Spirit of God is gonna break through your lethargy and that the Spirit of God is gonna break through your walls and he's gonna say something to you that's gonna matter to you to shape you and to change you here in the next few minutes. Because the, here's the thing. The Spirit of God can do in one moment what I could never do in a lifetime of standing up in front of you and trying to convince you of things and all that. And when the Spirit of God just lasers in on you and says, this is what I want to say to you, he can and he will. Amen. Now he desires for you to be receptive to that. So all that to say, how does persecution attempt to steal our freedom? Because remember, what we're talking about in this series is what it means to walk free, right? Not what it means to be all bound up and chained up, but what does it mean to walk free? Paul is making an argument in the book of Galatians for the reality of people walking in freedom, not for them to walk in chains. So the people in Galatia, the believers in Galatia are being persecuted. And as a result of that persecution, they, if they give into it, they're going to be bound up themselves. He's saying, that's not how I want you to live. That's not how God wants you to live. He wants you to live free. But what does it mean to live free? Well, persecution makes an effort to try and steal our freedom. So how does it do that? Because maybe if we can see that, we can start understanding some things about ourselves. Here's the first thing I'd say. Persecution tries to steal our freedom because it exposes our need for affirmation. I'm about to get real, real, real close to you. Closer than you like. It exposes our need for affirmation. Everybody wants to be liked. Everybody wants to be accepted. Everybody wants everybody to think that they're cool. Everybody wants everybody to say they're part of the in rather than on the out. 
We don't like being people that are considered on the margins. We don't like being people that are considered being outside. We like to be on the in because we feel embraced. We feel affirmed. And sometimes our need for affirmation is more important to us than the reality of relationship to Jesus Christ. And what persecution does is it tries to steal our freedom because it will expose our need for affirmation. Let me see if I can remind you of something. When Paul started out his letter, he knew that the people in Galatia were struggling because they wanted to be accepted by all these people who came from the mothership in Jerusalem, you know, and were saying, well, this is what you got to do. And he knew that they wanted to be accepted by them. Paul, for crying out loud, Paul really probably didn't, you know, didn't walk around in life going, I hope everyone hates me. Who does that? No, no human being walks around going, I hope everyone hates me. I hope everybody casts me out. I hope nobody ever receives me. I hope nobody listens to what I have to say. Nobody does that. But Paul had to get over the fact that he was bringing the gospel and that the gospel cuts. And sometimes it cuts hard. And when it does, sometimes people are going to be all jacked up about it. And they're going to be angry with you. And they're going to be upset with you. And he had to go, you know what? I know where my affirmation comes from. In fact, in chapter 1, we read it when I was teaching, when I opened the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 1, in verse number 10, it says these words. Paul said, am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. In other words, Paul's saying this. Look, if I just wanted to please men, if this is what I wanted to do, why do you think I would have signed up for following Jesus? Because it's not working out real well for me. Shipwrecks, bitten by scorpions, stoned and left for dead, you know, all that kind of stuff. In fact, he ends the book of Galatians by saying, let nobody give me any trouble because I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. If he wanted to just please people, it wouldn't be following Jesus. Would be the, that wouldn't be the route he needs to choose. See, Paul had to deal with where his affirmation came from. You remember we talked about the same thing with Stephen, I, I, with Peter, right, in Galatians. Remember that Paul had to oppose Peter? Because what, remember what Peter was doing? Peter had been transformed. He understood the gospel. And now he goes to Galatia and he's meeting with all these people who aren't Jewish. And he's hanging out with them and he's eating, you know, barbecue sandwiches with them and having some pork dinner, you know, and just loving life and going, woohoo, you know. And he's like, man, we're brothers. We're sisters in Christ. We're sharing this journey of faith together. And then what happens? The people from Jerusalem show up. And guess what happens to Peter? Well, Galatians 2 tells us, right? Verse number 12, it says, before certain men came from James, that's referring to Jerusalem, Peter used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Hmm. P Peter wanted to be accepted. He wanted to be liked. Peter had a name for, you know, he was one of the apostles from Jerusalem, in fact. This is where it kind of all began. And now those from the circumcision group were really strong about what they were saying, and they were forcing people to do certain things. And Peter got a little bit sideways, and he didn't know where his affirmation really came from, and he started doing something wrong. And Paul had to withstand him to his face. You see, what persecution does, ladies and gentlemen, in your life is exposes your need for affirmation. And you see, this is a part of what God wants to do to laser in on how you can walk free instead of walking chained up. You've got to learn where your affirmation comes from. And when I was a college student, like every 19-year-old, I wanted to be accepted. I wanted everybody to be friends with me. I wanted everybody to like me, right? How many of you in here are in high school or in college right now? Just how many of you are in here, high school or college, all right? There's a bunch of you. Listen, I understand high school, college, you want to be liked. One of the great difficulties is you want to fit into a group. You want to have some friends. You want people to respect you for who you are. And so when, when that may not happen or if it doesn't happen, we'll almost do anything for it to happen, even if it means acting like a fool. So in college, I, I had some friends, but they weren't really friends, they used to come over to our apartment all the time because my, my roommate, who was uh, one of my roommates, was significantly older and, 
And as a result, he met some of the football players on campus at the University of Georgia. Some of them were kind of iconic. And they can't, used to come over and, you know, have parties at our place, and, and it would get a little bit crazy. They didn't even know my name. They called me by a nickname, but they didn't even know my name. So we weren't real tight. And then summer uh, between my sophomore and junior year in college is when really Jesus Christ just got a hold of me and he wrecked me. And I like it. He just wrecked me. Yeah, has Jesus ever done that? He's just like, he comes in and just messes up everything. You know what I mean? In a good way. Just messes everything up. It's like everything I held dear and everything I held on to, he just went, mm mm. Uh uh-uh, uh, it's me. Okay, all right, wreck the ship, and let me get off, and let me stand on the mighty tower. I'm going to stand with Jesus. So everything changed for me. I went back to school, still living with the same roommates that I lived with. They were still living on the wild side. Even, I mean, literally, when I walked in the door back to school, they are still living on the wild side. And I remember just going, oh, man, man, it's me and Jesus, and that's it. Just me and you on the whole campus of the University of Georgia. It's me and Jesus. I am a man among the wolves. It is a problem, right? And so I remember one day, it was just literally the first couple of weeks of school. I'd been back. My life really was transformed. I'd really given my life to Christ and walking with him. And I'm walking down uh, into what they call the Tate Center, kind of a student area. And sitting on this brick wall were two running backs from the University of Georgia, one of which went, went on to play pro ball and was actually all pro one year. He played in this state. He didn't play in this city, but he played in this state. And I heard my nickname yelled. I hadn't heard that in a while. I heard this nickname that they called me yelled, and, uh, and it wasn't a good one. And, you know, nonetheless, that's what it was. And I turned, and I looked at those guys, and they were like, what's up? You know, and I was like, well, what's up? And in my mind, I was going, I need a diaper scared to death right now. And I walked over to them and they're like, Hey man, you guys, uh, what's going on? You guys still, you still at the same place? Yeah, I'm still living there. Uh, you guys having any parties or are you doing it? And I was like, well, um, you know, literally it was like, it's time. I'm 19. What am I going to do? It's just me standing in front of two running backs, both of which I could have whooped, but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. I, I showed some restraint just because I, because I was now a Christian and I love people. So I looked at him and I was like, well, here's the deal. Nobody had to convince me guys that I was a sinner. I don't think you needed convincing. I certainly didn't, didn't need convincing, but I realized that because of my sin, I was separated from God, but that God in his mercy showed me an incredible amount of grace and showed the world grace by sending his own son to live a sinless life, to die on a cross, pour his blood out as a sacrifice and as a substitute for us, and he rose from the dead, and if we put our faith in him, everything changes, and you know what? That's what happened to me. Now, oh yeah, I wish you would have been there then. It would have been nice if I'd have had some people going, Dad, a boy, that's right. Because it was me and Jesus, man. And they were kind of like, uh, uh, all right. That's pretty much what I got, all right, you know. But you know what? Listen, I felt free. You know why? Because I realized my life is not tied up in the affirmation of those people that I needed affirmation from. My life is tied up in the affirmation of God. That's what my life is tied up in. Uh, It wasn't within maybe a week or two of that event that I was walking down the sidewalk on campus carrying my my book bag and stuff on the other side uh, of the street, and it was a real wide street because buses came through there. There was a guy named Chuck Carswell. He played football for the University of Georgia also, and he was walking up this sidewalk all the way on the other side, and I heard him yell out, Jerry! And I looked over and I was like, Chuck, what's up? And he had this real serious look on his face, and he went, hey, man, I heard some things are different about you. And I just went, dog, (laughs) just trying to keep it a secret. (laughs) And I was like, yeah, (laughs) see you later. Because it was just me and Jesus. He went, you still at the same place? And I was like, yeah. He said, I'm calling you tonight. And I was like, okay. And then he left, and I started sucking my thumb, pulled my milk bottle out. And, 
more, 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 more. So I get home that night. I'm petrified the whole night. I'm just like, Chuck's going to call me. <laughs> Phone rings, you know, and they're like, hey, you, who's it for? Who do you think it's for? And I was like, I don't know. It's not for me. <laughs> they're like, Jerry, it's for you. Okay, who is it? It's my mom? Nope. <laughs> Chuck Carswell. I was like, okay. So I pick up the phone. Hey, Chuck. <clears throat> hey, Chuck. What's up? What's up, Chuck? He said, uh, hey, man, what happened to you? I go, great. I mean, what do you do? So I just unloaded. I just went ahead and just, I, I just dropped a gospel bomb. I was like, look, he's, he's not here live, so he can't whoop me. So I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna unload the gospel bomb on him lovingly, but I was just like, dude, here's what happened in my life. Here's what God did to change my life. Here's what was going on. And I just laid it all out there and I just kept talking. I didn't even want him to start talking because I was thinking maybe I can talk until he falls asleep or, <laughs> or just passes out or something because I was nervous. And so I, finished, I finally finished talking. Chuck goes, hmm, that's what happened to me this summer. And I went, it's now me, Jesus, and Chuck. And that works out well. I was thinking, this persecution thing is a little difficult. It's just me and Jesus, but now it's me, Jesus, and I've got a bodyguard. But do you know what it is? Listen. Free. You're free. Because it's not about what everybody's affirmation of you is, that you've got to do things to be accepted. Listen, I've been accepted in the beloved because of what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ. And if I can learn to live in the reality of the gospel and what God has done to accept us through his son, Jesus, not because we, we deserve it, not because we're so valuable and important and incredible and, and so impressive, but because God's impressed with his son and because he's shown us great mercy, when we can live like that, we live free, man. We're not going to bed at night going, oh, what am I going to do? I've got to keep up with this group and this group and this group and this group. And I've got to impress them and I've got to impress them and I've got to impress them because sometimes what happens to us, I'm running out of breath. Sometimes what happens to us is this. We take the value of the affirmation of people and it becomes more important to us than the value of relationship to God's son. Persecution will expose your need for affirmation. It's why, sir, it's why, ma'am, it's why, young person, you'll do the things you do with all of your friends and go to bed at night knowing that you're not living free. You'll do it because you're like, I, I need to just, well, they won't like me if I start standing up for Jesus. They won't, they won't like me if I do these things. They may not. Maybe they will. You don't know. But I don't, listen, if every man in the world doesn't like me, I'm not trying to be obnoxious, but if everyone doesn't like me and God says, I'm good. Amen. I'm good with you because of my son Jesus. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. We have to know where our affirmation comes from. Some of you have just... You've given yourselves over and over and over to being affirmed in all the wrong places. And that's what persecution will do. It steals your freedom because it will expose your need for affirmation. I could stay here for probably a long time, but let me move ahead. Why, how else does persecution steal our freedom? I'll stop with this one. It causes us to fear, thank you. It causes us to fear the, the offense of the gospel. This is what persecution does to try and steal our freedom. It causes us to fear the offense of the gospel. Now let me pause for just a second. The gospel itself is offensive to many people. It's offensive. You know why? Because in this day and age, when we say these words, Jesus Christ is the only way to God. You can't know God except through Jesus. When you start saying stuff like that, the world that we live in is like, phew, phew, how dare you say something like that? Well, yeah, how dare I say something like that? I'm, listen, the gospel has an offense. It's built in. It's a built-in offense. That doesn't mean you have to be obnoxious. You see, sometimes we wear this badge and we're like, yeah, the whole world persecutes me and they don't like me because I'm a follower of Jesus. No, it may just be because you're obnoxious. 
It may actually have nothing to do with Jesus at all. It may be that they would love to hear about Jesus, but they're too busy looking at your misrepresentation of him. Because you bought into the bill of goods in this world that says that toleration and political correctness is where we have to live. And so you start maybe saying, well, uh, you know, and, and, you're, and you just get obnoxious about it. And people are like, good grief, man. That's not what I, I'd love to know about Jesus, but I'd like to see a representation of what he looks like and how he acts. Right. And see, toleration is kind of the spirit of the age. That is not the spirit of the believer. Love is. Love. Love is so much better than toleration. We ought to tolerate every... What? Tolerate? Love. That's what God's called us to. Here's the thing. Listen, listen. Truth and freedom go together. There's there's people that... Your freedom gets stolen. Your freedom gets stolen because you think that you can live putting the gospel in the back seat. But you know good and well you're not free. Because when you bail out on the gospel, you're not free. You see, Jesus made this really clear in John chapter 8. And in fact, he referenced Abraham and he referenced slavery and all this. Listen to what he said. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. See, truth and freedom go together. And they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we will be set free? Jesus said, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you're Abraham's descendants. In other words, ethnically, you're Abraham's descendants. Yet you're ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I've seen in the Father's presence, and you do what you've heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do the things Abraham did. As it is, you're determined to kill me, a man who's told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You're doing the things your own father does. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. You know what he went on to tell them? He said, nah, your father's the devil. That's what he said. Now, was Jesus being obnoxious? No. But is the message of the cross and the message of Jesus being the the only way to God offensive? Yes. But what persecution does to us, listen, is it causes us to fear the offense of the gospel. And when you start, listen, when you start bailing out on the gospel, you're not living free anymore. You're living bound up. Well, you know, I just don't want to be narrow-minded, Jerry, because, you know, everybody's got to find their own truth. Listen, you keep living like that, shackle man. Keep living like that, shackle woman. Everybody find their own truth. If everybody had their own truth and much of those truths are conflicting, hello, do I need to spell it out? The gospel of Jesus Christ says you cannot know God except through the Son. You cannot make your way to the Father except through the Son. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, he's either lying or he's out of his mind or he's telling the truth, and you can decide that. And by the way, I I am affirming of everybody having the freedom to decide that. If they say, I think you're an idiot and I think you're wrong, I'm going to love them anyway. I don't call them names. I'm just going to love them anyway. But let me tell you something. By the grace of God, I'm not putting the gospel in the back seat. So if the newspaper calls or the, or the, or the, uh, the television station calls, hey, Pastor Gillis, we want your opinions on blank. And it happens to me all the time. They don't always show what I'm talking about, but I want to say to you and be accountable before you, I tell them the gospel. Amen. 
If they ask me questions, I'm telling them that it's about Jesus Christ, that every person is a sinner, that they can't save themselves, that it only comes through Jesus Christ. It's not by the works of our flesh, but it's by the power of his spirit. It's by God's grace through our faith. It's not of our works, lest anyone should boast. I'm telling them the gospel. Listen, I'm not being a jerk about it. I'm trying to be diplomatic about it. I'm trying to say it in grace and in truth. But you've got to understand something. When we start locking up the gospel in the back seat, we start punching out on the gospel, you will not understand what it means to live free. You see, when I had the opportunity to say to people who knew me and knew that I wasn't living for Jesus, and then Jesus had transformed my life, when I got to look them in the eye and lovingly, humbly, just be able to say to them, here's what Christ has done in my life. Here's what I understand Christ wants to do in your life. It is so freeing that I don't have to go to bed at night having to apologize for Jesus, having to apologize for the offense of the cross. Because, listen, Paul said in 1 Corinthians these words, he said, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's why in the book of Romans, he said these words. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. If we are ashamed of Jesus' gospel, listen, it's like we're ashamed of good news. Good news that sinners can be saved. Good news that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. This is great news, but we lock it back up here. Why? Because we're scared to death of what people are going to think about us. We just need that affirmation. We need those people to like us and keep us on the in circle. Listen, you better make sure that your circle includes Jesus. Because if it doesn't, you're going to live shackled up in your life and not ever understand what it means to live free. Young man, young woman in this room, high schooler or college student or young single adult, listen, do not sacrifice your freedom on the altar of people's opinions. Do not sacrifice your freedom on the altar of having everybody else's affirmation. You need the affirmation of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is enough for you. It doesn't mean, by the way, that I'm saying you shouldn't want to have friends or that you need to be obnoxious or to be a jerk or any of those kinds of things. No, I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying is this, you got to make your choice early and you make your choice strong and you say, whatever else happens, whatever anybody thinks, I'm going to walk with Jesus. You know what I, you know what I like? This is, there's so many different people. I, I, I'm very appreciative of what Tim Tebow's stand is. You know, you can, he went to Florida and we'll forgive him for that as a Georgia Bulldog. But do you know what? Listen, I know people have varying opinions on all that and whatever they are. Here, at the end of the day, you know what I like? He's serious about Jesus. You know, whatever else you want to say, he's serious about Jesus and he's walking the walk. I would hate for people to try and make him a perfect guy or any of that kind of stuff. Man, cut him some slack. But he really does love Jesus. He really is trying to serve him. But you know, really, listen, he's not facing that much in the way of persecution. I mean, really, I mean, is it, professional football players making plenty of money and, you know, God's blessed him in that regard. And if, and if there's some people around the country that go, I can't believe he kneels down to pray or he talks about Jesus so much, well, he probably just goes, whatever. You know, whatever, right? As opposed to Yusef Nader Khani, who is saying, I- I'm not gonna recant my faith even if it costs me my life. And he's got a sentence of execution over his head. If you can't embrace the gospel strongly enough to let it have the strength to define your affirmation and your relationships, good thing you live in America because you sure couldn't represent Jesus anywhere else. Persecution wants to steal your freedom by opposing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to determine, by the grace of God, where your affirmation is going to come from and whether you are going to do what the Scripture says, live free in Jesus or live shackled up. Let's bow our heads together. We're gone in just a moment, and I ask if you don't have to move that you don't out of respect for the people around you. If you're here and you've never before entrusted your life to Jesus, when we dismiss in just a moment, whether you're in this room or you're in the East Worship Center, I'd ask you to just come by the fireside room. There'll be pastors and prayer partners in there who would love to talk to you about what it means to begin a relationship with God through his son, Jesus. If you want your sins forgiven, Jesus has done that for you on the cross. 
you wanna put your faith in him, he can change you from the inside out. He can make everything new. He can make everything different. He can give you the affirmation that maybe you've been looking for in all the wrong places. If that's your need, I want you to come by the fireside room when we dismiss in just a minute, but that's on you. And I'll be honest with you. I don't even really care about making it easy on you. Are you kidding me? We've got people that are in jail cells and under execution sentences for their faith. And you can't sit in an air-conditioned building and walk a few yards into a room full of people who are your biggest fans and who wanna be your biggest fans to confess Jesus. If you can't, if you can't confess Jesus in a place like this with people cheering for you and hoping for you and praying for you, and I, I don't know where you can. So if that's your need, if you need to receive Jesus, then you come by the fireside room in just a minute. For the rest of us, maybe God the Holy Spirit pointed out something in your heart, in your life. Maybe it's time to do business with him, to drop an anchor, to say, my hope is found in Jesus alone, not by any other relationship. I, I love the relationships that I have. I treasure them. I thank God for my friends that know Jesus. I thank God for my friends that don't. I wanna love them. I wanna show them the love of Christ. But I'm not putting the gospel in the back seat ever again. I'm not gonna let my need to be affirmed by people overwhelm the reality of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay. Father, help us to be a people who graciously, gracefully, humbly and lovingly demonstrate the gospel of Jesus Christ and who truthfully do it, that we would be a people that don't put the gospel in the back seat, that we don't cave to the God of this age, that we don't allow for persecution to shackle us because it wants to steal our freedom. It is for freedom that we have been set free. And I pray that we would all begin to drink that in deeply, that when we live in the reality of the gospel, our identity, our affirmation, our relationships, our choices, everything is made and changed in the light of Jesus. Father, I pray you'd help us with that for your glory and for the good of the world that we live in that so desperately needs to see you and to know you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Love you, have a great week.